time of those of you. Be mindful of those of you who are on time. And you just got the message that this um, program is being recorded. So thank you all for joining us. I'm Joanna Picori. I'm the director of the Asian Arts and Culture Center. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this gallery talk by Fan Hong to celebrate the opening of her show at the Asian Arts and Culture Center, A Bag of Rocks for a Bag of Rice. We are so dis uh, disappointed that you can't actually come to our gallery <laughs> to see the show, most of you. It is available to um, Towson University students, staff and faculty with an appointment. You can, um, if you are in that category, you can email us at asianarts at towson.edu. Otherwise, we hope um, all the rest of you will enjoy our online exhibit, which um, just went live. Um, Fan Hong created for us a large scale landscape paintings. Oh, she normally, sorry, before she created, she, her traditional work is to create large scale landscape paintings, sculptures, installations, and performance to initiate dialogues about the current crises of world ecology. Her work has never been more relevant or urgent. Tonight, she'll introduce you to her newest work, A Bag of Rocks for a Bag of Rice, created specifically for the Asian Arts and Culture Center's Asian Arts Gallery at Towson University. The installation engages East Asian gardens to interrogate histories of empire, wealth, privilege, and exploitation responsible for ecological extraction and displacement. As I said earlier, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is an all too real example of the issues that Hong illuminates. We have, we have to limit access to the exhibition. Um, so to see the exhibit online, you can go to our website, www.towson.edu backslash Asian Arts. And then there is our um, centers and events page that we'll also post in the chat where you can get access to the online exhibition. Um, I wanna draw your attention to this beautiful background that is behind me. This is one of the works in the exhibition and it's a Zoom background that's available to everybody through our website. So you can um, click um, on our website and grab it there. And I think we may be also putting a link to it right in the chat. I want to shout out to our wonderful new graduate assistant, Sabrina Mogul, Mogul who is um, doing the chat for us. <laughs> so um, let's see. So our program page also lists some related programs, programs related to this exhibition, which delve deeper into the issues that Vaughn explores in the exhibit. On Saturday, September 26th at 10 a.m., we have a forest bathing workshop with Anna Kahahunui, who I believe is here. Hi, Anna. And on um, October 20th at 7 p.m., that's a Tuesday, we have a pan panel discussion, Gardening for the Future, with Fawn, Natasha Myers, Nicole DeFeo, and Mary Lewis. And on November 14th, a Saturday at 11 a.m., we'll be working with Blue Water Baltimore and Fawn to present a pollinator gardening design workshop. These programs are part of our fall 2020 season entitled Cultivating Connections, which focuses on the connections we all have to each other and nature. It's more urgent than ever, than ever that we recognize and cultivate these connections as the destructive power of divisions become abundantly clear. Additional programs in the season include a festival called Our Stories, which is a virtual festival kick kicking off on October 1st at 7 p.m. featuring, um, I think we have 27 storytellers over six weeks from uh, various locations, in including Baltimore, New York City, and even India. And then on October 16th, we have Asia North 2020 Art and Music Exchange connected to our Asia North online exhibition, which we launched in May. So we'll be featuring some artists from that show and from the community. 
Um, we also have a limited number of Korean kite making kits for those of you who have um, loved to make things or have younger um, people in your households who you want to keep engaged in STEAM activities, um, art, science, social studies, and engineering. And there is a link I think we'll be putting in the chat for how you can order those kits. Uh, those kits were created because we were supposed to be at the great Baltimore Kite Festival. And of course that got canceled. So now we have the kits available for people to use at home. So before turning the program over to Fawn, I'd like to note that the Asian Arts and Culture Center is a self-support department of Towson University. That means we have to raise all the money needed for our operations and programs from memberships, grants, sponsorships, and individual donations. So I hope that you'll make a donation tonight to show your support by going to our website. You can donate from almost any page on our website on the sidebar. There's also a support us page which describes the many ways you can support us. We'll put a link to our donation form in the chat as well. And it, we are having this exhibit and these wonderful programs because of the generous support we've received so far. And I wanna thank everybody who has supported us. That includes the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Maryland State Arts Council, the William G. Baker Jr. Memorial Fund, the Central Baltimore Partnership, the Asian Arts and Culture Center members, the Towson University College of Fine Arts and Communication, the Citizens of Baltimore County, the Roe and Marius P. Johnson Legacy Charitable Fund, Yoshinobu and Kathleen Shiota, the Harold J. Kaplan Foundation, the Towson University COFAC, the College of Fine Arts, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the Towson University Marketing and Com Communications Department, the Towson University B2U Presidential Priority, Robert Mintz and Beth Arman, Anthony and Bonnie Montcalmo, Alexander Noggle, Connie Rosemont, and John Greenberg. And thanks to all of you who are here who support us. And for those of you who have not yet contributed, please know that every dollar counts. You can donate $1 or more tonight by visiting our website. And also I wanna ask you at the end of the um, program to fill out an evaluation because that helps us to um, demonstrate our value to all of our funders. So I'd now like to introduce our special guest, Fawn Hong. Fawn is a multidisciplinary artist who uses large scale landscape paintings, sculptures and installations and performance to stage the sublime and formidable beauty of a post human earth. She presents an optimistic post apocalypse stemming from her sympathy for nature and her disappointment in humanity's inability to cease or even slow down its ecologically destructive habits. In Hong's most recent body of work, she employs unnatural, lurid colors combined with modern day warfare tactics such as camouflage to create environments that conceal themselves for protection. Hong lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland. She received her MFA from the Mount Royal School of Multidisciplinary Art at MICA in 2015 and her BFA in painting from Boston University in 2004. Her recently held solo exhibitions uh, were at the Baltimore Museum of Art, Smithsonian Arts and Industry Building, Spring Break Art Show in New York, Arlington Art Center in Arlington, VA, School 33 in Baltimore, Maryland. Hong also has participated in group exhibitions in Brooklyn, New York and Miami Beach, Florida. She received a Ruby's Artist Project Grant in Media Arts and Performing Arts in 2017. She is also a 2018 Sondheim Art Prize semifinalist, 2018 Trawick Prize semifinalist, and a 2019 Greater Baltimore Culture Alliance Baker Prize finalist. Her work has been featured in various publications, including The Observer, Hyperallergic, Art F City, Baltimore Art Magazine, Baltimore City Paper, and Baltimore Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Fawn Hong. <laughs> um, hi, and thank you so much, Joanna, for a very like awesome introduction. And um, I also, before we get started, I really want to do some quick shout outs as well. Um, again, thank you, Joanna, for inviting me to be able to do this show. And also for Nerissa, who um, 
is helping with like all the behind the scenes tech um, and um, I guess then to both of you for just helping with like all the online logistical fire hoops that we had to do to like get the show together because of COVID. Um, and then thank you, Sabrina, for being able to help out with um, helping with Zoom and everything. Um, and then I guess to the donors that Joanna like, you know, listed because that helped fund the show. And if without that help, then there'll probably be no show. Um, and I, also to the following people who helped me pretty much like make various aspects of the show, I guess, perfect or come together. Um, my partner, Malcolm Major, Elliot Dowdy, Gerald Major, my mom, my dad, and Joshua Sender, since he helped me get like this Ming Liu typeface that I really wanted for, for like, you know, my title or like for, you'll see, you'll see my wall text. Um, I also want to acknowledge that my exhibition was created and takes place on the ancestral lands of the Pascatewaya people, which is known today as Baltimore and Towson. I humbly offer my respects to the Pikastawe community for the privilege of having this exhibition due to the direct and indirect violence of settler communities. Um, so before we get started, 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 um, I just want to let you know, like, so when planning this opening, um, which was tough because obviously you you all can't be here i wanted to try to provide a way to make it as realistic and as um as experiential or you know just like really trying to find a way for everyone to be able to be here or feel like you're in the space so what i guess i came up with was trying to give you like this pre-recorded video tour as if you were here in the gallery like how i virtually am and like I am now, even though I'm at home, but I'm trying to like pretend like, here we are, here we are at this gallery space that probably only five people can really go to, thanks to COVID. Um, and so I'll be giving a video tour of the show and then also talk about the show as if I were in the space. Um, so, but with that said, like, I just wanna let you know that the video is like, I'm not very good at video and so we can call this an experimental or avant-garde video, as you'll see soon. And it's only 13 minutes, um, not too long. And then after that, we'll end with a, a Q and A, or we can continue the conversation and all that, all that cool stuff. So um, I guess we can start the party. Hi, my name is Fawn Hong, and I would like to thank you for coming to my virtual opening for a bag of rocks for a bag of rice here at Towson University Asian Arts and Cultural Center. Let's go look at the show. So as you enter the gallery, you see the name and title of the show. And over here is the porcelain vessel for the Asian Art Gallery's collection. I'm really excited to be able to use this piece because you'll see how it ties into everything. And so as you enter into the gallery, you step directly into a physical painted landscape of a mountain range. And you can walk through this space as if you were immersed in that landscape. You can observe all the painted details and features of the mountains. You can walk behind the mountains. You can peek through it. And you just keep going and as you exit the mountain range, here you will see a small rock garden. And then also on the wall, a painting that resembles a traditional Chinese landscape painting. And as you finish looking at the painting, you turn around and look back out into the landscape. Then you go back out into the mountains and look at the garden and the painting from there.
And go around again if you prefer. Then let's go back around again through the mountainscape. So now we can observe what it looks like on the back side of the paintings. And as you can see, it's painted in the blue and white porcelain color palette as the rock garden. So here we are back at the beginning of the show and the dubbing is gonna get really horrible and serious now, so please bear with me. So my work has typically focused on creating these immersive environments on what I would call an optimistic post-apocalypse. So the Earth's environment beyond humanity due to climate change or whatever apocalypse we end up having in general. But regardless, Earth continues to live on and thrive without us and possibly better without us. But in the past year and a half, as I further continued my research into the Anthropocene, which is the idea of human activity causing our mass extinction through climate change and other man-made environmental disasters, but investigating into deeper understanding how the repercussions of colonialism and the enslavement of Black and Indigenous people used to advance capitalistic enterprises. So I guess the other term for that would be the capitalocene. So capitalism being the reason for all human, animal, and plant life. Um, to go through mass extinction, um, I felt that my work really needed to acknowledge these deeper and intersectional systemic issues, that it wasn't right to gloss over these histories and say, humans suck, or there's no hope for humanity, we all deserve this, bye, when really it's not all of humanity's fault, it's really thanks in part to a specific group of people with a very specific mindset. And then realizing that I have been thinking about these issues, but the language wasn't really there for me at the time. So I was like looking back at my work that I did in undergrad, um, like which was like 16 to 20 years ago. Um, and like, I guess what I did a little bit after undergrad, um, which really primarily focused on painting and drawing images of people doing yard work in the suburbs. I grew up in a suburb called Coral Springs in South Florida. So constantly was surrounded by, you know, just landscapers, you know, people maintaining their yards the best that they can. Um, and also just like everything there, like especially in South Florida, is so perfectly um, manicured and landscaped. So anyways, just realizing that my subject matter has always been informed by my fascination with why we as humans go about maintaining a natural environment in such an unnatural way and wanting to really dig into how these histories may have reverberated into our current relationships with nature um, today and especially like with through control, um, whether it be botanical gardens, landscaping, controlling weeds and other pests um, and even maintaining houseplants. Not to say that we shouldn't have houseplants, but when you really break it down, you are in a way taking a plant that was indigenous to an outside environment and putting it into a controlled environment. Anyways, so wanting to explore these ideas and having the opportunity to show here at the Asian Arts Culture Gallery here in Towson University, I felt it was the right moment and space to connect this abstract to Chinese and Japanese gardens. And I really wanted to focus on the Chinese and Japanese garden, not because it's part of my cultural background or history, but also because their designs and design philosophies tend to either get reappropriated and exoticized, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally throughout history and today. Um, so, and it always just seems like it's always through this very Orientalist lens, and I wanted to use this opportunity to subvert that. So initially, before diving into more in-depth research about Chinese and Japanese gardening culture, I really thought about my takeaways from reading Catherine Yusoff's book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, and also um, having a, attended a, this like one week intensive seminar about the Anthropocene down at ICA Miami. Um, last summer. And I guess I started this journey by thinking about who the garden is commissioned for and 
who would be exploited labor-wise. And of course, to no surprise, it's always someone in a position of power, privilege, and wealth exploiting the labor of those who are disadvantaged. So for instance, emperors, higher government officials, merchants, etc. But that discovery led to, which became even more fascinating to me, was to find out how the design and the obsession to create these gardens for private use came about. And ironically enough, it was artists, the art of Chinese landscape paintings and poetry by the literati. Not like Taoism, which some people may have led to believe, but, you know, played a little bit of a part. But anyways, those who commissioned these gardens for their homes love landscape painting of all these mountainscapes. And it was like their TV because they're working their butts off, you know, governing and whatnot, making money. And where, to the point where they wish they could just really drop everything and head to the mountains to get away from it all. Well, since they couldn't, for obvious logistical reasons, they're like, I'm going to bring that landscape to me. And that's how the paintings and sculptures for the exhibition itself manifested. It's like their obsession with finding that perfect rock, plant, etc., to be transplanted from another location and made into their dream mini landscape. So kind of like in a way they're like, commissioning um, their own immersive installation that will make them feel as if they are in nature, using the principles of nature, and then really going out of their way to other regions in China. It's like you're in northern China. Apparently, all the good rocks are in south China, so they would import and pay top dollar to have these rocks extracted from, say, a river, a lake, a mountainside, etc., all because it looked like it came from their favorite painting, or maybe even one of the most famous paintings, or because a famous artist that their friends was said to do that, um, or they listened to Ji Chang's like, you know, um, manual on the craft of gardening. Um, but you know, like a lot of it, what I read was that it was kind of like this competition on to see who has the best garden as well. Um, anyway, so, um, but I guess what I find so fascinating is that these paintings are just represent, um, representational abstractions, like simple ink on paper created by gesture and the pressure of a brush saturated with just the right amount of ink. It's not like some actual super realistic representation, um, representational painting like an Albert Breerstadt or like a Caspar David Friedrich landscape painting. As you can see here, um, I created physically and I guess painterly or painted my idealized mountain range that um, you know I can walk through and explore. I wanted this to be large scale and three dimensional, but also two dimensional to play on the natural and the unnatural and to speak about how like these mountains were, I guess, created and inspired by, by painting. And then over here we have the garden, which I guess really visually represents more of the Japanese rock garden. Um, this space was inspired more by paintings that specifically highlighted objects in a garden. So this is my philosopher's rock, some plants, a bench that you can sit on, and this natural wood end table that features some porcelain from the gallery's collection, but also there's this barrier that sits above the rocks to kind of represent like not being allowed or allowing certain people to be allowed into the space. Um, and as a way to represent the preciousness of a garden, so for instance, like the cost associated with constructing and managing one, I chose the classic blue and white color scheme that you typically see on Chinese and English fine porcelain. And then over here, there's an actual 2D painting to represent an, I guess, like an actual Chinese landscape painting um, that reflects back in conversation to the mountainscape um, or to the, the mountainscape sculptures um, to tie the space together. 
And just to quickly show you, the backs of the mountains are also created in the same blue and white porcelain color scheme to match the, the garden itself. So I'm going to stop here for now. And um, even though I know I might have not gotten to everything, but we can do Q&A and have a conversation and take a break, you know, um, have a drink. And also, other than that, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Greatly appreciate it. Well, so that was it. <laughs> so that, very, very avant-garde, right? I guess. Yes. I don't, um, and yeah. Um, anyways, I guess I'll, I'll start with questions just to, to get it going. Um, and, oh, thank you. Thank you, Savannah. I think that's you or Imani. Um, anyways. So now I'm, I'm just like going through this chat. So um, I guess for Anna, who um, asked about how I selected my color palette, and I, I guess it's very, very great question. I usually have very specific reasons why I select my color palette. And um, and I guess, I guess the color palette kind of started out with thinking, oh, well, how did I really go about it, to be honest? probably like really looking a lot at um, at a Chu Ying's like, like um, Chinese paintings. And then also just, I, I just really wanted like jewel tones, I guess, for some reason. And, um, and just felt like it was, it was necessary. And um, I don't know, for some reason, it just came naturally that way. Like these blues and greens were just very natural color palettes that I usually see in Chinese painting and stuff like that. And, and then I guess like, I'll, I'll quick, quick shout out to like the painting right behind me, like this one right here. Like I did think of Nina Q. Allen the entire time, just like this, cause she loves amethyst and stuff like that. But um, actually like if you go on the website, it's, they're all named after precious gems that you would actually be able to mine from like the region and stuff like that. So the green one that you can see, if you can see my mouse, I don't know, like I'm going to go this way. That green one is like Jade and then the big mountain here is like Sapphire. And then I think this one is, I want to say the Amazon. Ruby or like one of them is Ruby and one of them is Amethyst. I gotta, I gotta look it up. So, oh, Opal, thank you, Nerissa. <laughs> um, so yeah, this one's, that one's Opal, this little guy right here and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, oh my God, Izzy. Wow. Yes, you're totally correct. That bench is my beloved forever recycled bench and that's funny that you brought that up because i like and i can show you all really quick if i can give me one second i can share my screen as to why this bench has i guess some significance um give me one second oh my god i had like all these photo tabs open and then of course now I can't find that. Oh, here we go. Give me one second. I'll share my screen. So what Izzy is talking about is um, this bench that you see right here that has actually been I guess what we can say upcycled from three other shows. So uh, this is like, I guess the fourth iteration. The first one was from um, this open or like this like artscape exhibition that I did where there were like two other benches. And then this was like the one that survived. And then I um, put it in like another exhibition, which is like at School of 33. 
And then it went to the BMA. And then now here it is at the, um, the like the TU um, Asian Arts Gallery and stuff like that. And even the rocks actually, funnily enough, like were also repurposed from like the BMA fire pit, if you guys are all familiar that I had. And like, this is kind of like, um, what I like to do with my artwork, since a lot of it has to deal with the environment and stuff like that, where I, you know, like if it still exists and can be repurposed, I'd rather reuse that object into another exhibition. So that way it doesn't just, you know, go to waste or anything like that. And um, so like, even like with the rocks and stuff like that, it's just like, I never, I couldn't get rid of it, you know? And then, but finally it was just beautiful moment to just be able to, to, I guess, like thoughtfully recycle it for this purpose and, and stuff like that. Um, and then Anna asked another question for the scale of the mountains. Did you make it to match your height and peek through views? Great question. Um, I, I wanted to be like larger than, like I wouldn't say like larger than life, but I really enjoy like this idea of just like having like the body scale to just be, um, I wanted to kind of um, overtake the room or feel like you're actually within the space. So that's kind of why I like have it um, matching my height. And I, I didn't really want, I didn't mean for it to like be able to peek through it. It just kind of happened to work out that way. And I'll be honest with you, like the intention of having the mountains or like, I guess like the big blue one, the sapphire one that you see here was to hopefully cover this door that you see right here. But then it didn't really work out that way because of COVID and because of, if you were like at the outside of the gallery, like I figured like if the gallery was closed and if you were a TU student or anyone who can just kind of peep by, you would be able to look at the exhibition from outside of the gallery. And then, then you would be able to kind of see this like sweeping view of the mountains to kind of just like kind of entice you in and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of how that came about. But like, I just really like having, you know, like the full scale, like, or just kind of like, yeah, just like having like these like interactions with, you know, like being in space and just making how that, I guess like how I make that like into an immersive environment. Um, from Vincent, what direction do you see slash want to see your future projects go? I don't know. <laughs> um, like, it, like the direction I go is usually based on the research that I'm doing at the moment. So like, I feel like, I, I guess like in the same type of genre, like I, I kind of want to continue exploring these like a very, I guess, aestheticized spaces or um, controlled spaces. So for instance, like, and I, and I don't know how that is going to come about, like, you know, it just, I guess will eventually work out that way. But like a, one thing, like I'm, like I guess as an example that I'm interested in in exploring are like medians in streets and um, how they're kind of like, landscaped and I guess this is coming from being again like from South Florida where if you go and see all these medians in in between the streets you just see like these beautiful palm trees and these like perfect hedges and stuff like that and I just always thought that was extremely interesting since um I don't know it just it just seems funny like you know to just I don't know I can show you a photo I do have a photo of that too and but I guess there's so many questions. Oh my God. Um, Irina, who also is from Coral Springs. Um, why did you select this title for the show? Well, that's actually written in the essay for the show that you guys can all view online. But since you're all here, I'll let you know. It's um, from, like the title came from like this Calvino essay I was reading about Japanese gardens where Calvino was walking around with like a student and, you know, like in a Zen garden in Japan and the student, like, you know, the student asked Calvino like, Hey, like, so like, how do you feel about like these gardens? Like blah, blah, blah. And then Calvino's like, Oh, it's like really nice. It's beautiful. Like, you know, this is 
what it's about. Like, you know, it's just like, you know, all this, you know, it's just like a peaceful area. But then the student is like, well, like, it's just so sad, like, to know that, like, all this, like, labor, like, you know, I guess, like, I wouldn't say bloodshed, but just like a lot of, like, this, like, labor that went into it um, is just kind of sad just for, like, this gar private garden and stuff like that. And, you know, like Calvino response was like, you know, but is this the price of culture, you know, like, and then like, is it though? Like, is that messed up to just like, you know, make this natural environment, like natural quote unquote environment for, um, I guess, yeah, like for just like the emperor to enjoy. And then, um, and then I guess they were with a tour guide and the tour guide kind of ties it in together and says like, oh, well, um, you know, like, the emperor or something like that and I, again like this is not exact but um long story short it's just like the tour guide mentions about how the um the garden was created because the emperor would give everyone who brought him a bag of rocks and in exchange gave them a bag of rice and he would go through all those rocks to like pick which was the right rock like the either like the smoothest the right shade of gray or whatever to put into his actual garden. And so that's kind of how that title came about. And actually like how thinking about this show came about was just like through that type of labor, like where like, you know, it's just like, we don't, we forget about it. Like we don't realize that a lot of work has been put into it. And like, we like, you know, it just, we don't think about like who's actually doing that physical labor. And, and even in today's gardening culture or like, even today, like, so if you have a landscaper or even if you um, are running a botanical garden, if you are, um, or even your own garden or like, but I guess like more like, you know, public gardens, like who is like really helping and responsible for that and stuff like that. So um, uh, how did my work evolve from when you first knew you were going to have the show to the end result says Amber, Eve Anderson and Josh Sender. Um, I don't know. It was really, it was a, it's a really big roller coaster ride. And I freaked out a lot. And Joanna knows this for sure. Cause I would just call her and be like, am I doing like, what, like, you know, like mostly because of COVID and not knowing like what could happen. And like, and this was just like, and the show was like kind of in the planning for about like a year and a half or two years. I feel like a while. And I went through like various renditions and then like ultimately like finally it was just like, okay, it was time to make the work, but then COVID happened. And I had like all these plans to go try to travel and like really visit other Chinese gardens and Japanese gardens in America. And like even like wrote a grant for it and all this stuff. And then, um, and and that sucked for not being able to go, <laughs> but like, um, where was I going with this? Like, it was, it was tough. It was, I, I guess like, because I've always been a very site specific person and to know like, you know, the possibilities of no one being able to see the show, like, I don't know, like it just went back and forth because it was like, for one minute, I was just like, should I just cancel the show? Like Black Lives Matter is happening. We should be focusing on that. Like, why should I be focusing on the, the show? That feels so selfish to like, um, even where like, well, if no one's gonna see the show, I'd rather just have it be like, meant to be made specifically for something online, you know, versus like having something in the space. And then, I don't know, it's just like a bunch of, a bunch of thoughts and then finally just like luckily forced myself to be just like no you just have to do this and but also like the other part was just like I did how do you even talk about like this deeper subject matter through artwork and painting and stuff like that and like that itself was like so complicated and complex where I was like I don't how do I do this I feel like I can only write an essay about this um so so yeah like I guess that's kind of how it evolved. And luckily I just kind of fell upon this, like where it just like the meta-ness of like replicating a garden from a painting and vice versa 
um, and then just really just went for it. And I'm, I'm glad it happened because it really helped me through COVID, like during the summer to like go to my studio and do work and not sit there and freak out and stuff like that. So I'm like happy that that happened, but I hope it worked out. Um, and then from one of the Alex Epstein's, uh, do you think you're going to adapt your artwork to be viewed virtually or ride out the pandemic and make work that will be viewed in person at some point? Great question. I have no idea. And because, I don't know, I just, you know, like, my work is so experiential that it's just like, you know, for you to be there physically, it's like really sad that no one can be in this space really, unless you're a TU student and make an appointment or um, with your mask on, please wear a mask. Um, and yeah, like I just don't have the skill set to really try to make it more virtual, but I don't know, maybe Josh Sender who's in the, in the, uh, in the audience can can help with that. Um, and then, uh, oh my God. Oh, Ray wants to ask me a question over the mic. And then also Irina said, this reminds me so much of Chinese gardens at the Huntington here in LA, which just announced a multi-million dollar expansion. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because this is still a thing like, you know, like, not, and I don't want to discount Chinese gardens or Zen gardens at all as like this kind of anti-cultural thing or anything like that. But it is just kind of like to give you an idea about the amount of maintenance, the amount of money, the amount of manpower, water, like all these ecological things that like, you know, especially like California is on fire right now. Um, just to make this garden that is not just really originally part of nature. It's just like this human idea of like nature if that makes sense and um and it's it's cool that it like has like money going towards it to be expanded and everything but is it being expanded in like a thoughtful way is like are they paying their um employees enough are they making sure they have like covid hazard pay um there was like an incident with like i think the portland chinese or no the portland japanese garden where there were like labor issues where they wanted to open to the public and they um, refused or not refused, like, you know, like they said it was okay for people to go to the garden without wearing masks at all. And like having like this kind of also uprising from their employees being like, that's not cool. And like, what if someone tests for, you know, like they're just being put in danger, but just because like they needed to make money for this garden, they were like getting people to go, which is like really problematic, I feel like. Um, and then, oh my God. Uh, so the for Lauren, the show is open to the public, but not really. It's would have been open to the public, but because of TU's latest, um, you know, I don't know. Like John, I can speak more about that. And then Nina, Q Allen, I feel the magic 100%. Are there mark about? marking in mountainscapes is symbol of calling action emotionally eh, not really it's just more like kind of really thinking about like the mountainscapes and in, in Chinese painting and stuff like that and what they're inspired by um and then I guess Ray do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question since I think I got oh to the bottom of of this chat box Cool. Um, hey, Fan. Hi. Uh, so excited to be here with you. Um, thanks for coming. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was, I had the privilege um, and the joy of talking to you, my goodness, a couple months ago about this mm -hmm. project. And uh, we'd had a lovely like chat um, about your ideas about the aesthetics of these gardens but how they seem to really um, clash with the idea of the materials used and the labor that was actually hidden by the very notion of the aesthetics being perfect. And you brace it um, a bit in your like presentation in your video about the idea of what was good 
or um, materials. And then like the fact that people had to find like the good rocks. And I do remember that. I'm remembering how um, the impact it had on me, the way you talked about it, because you you had such a um, like a, a really kind of what is it embodied way, a kind of a phenomenological way of talking about the labor of wanting the most perfect rocks and the way that the aestheticism of getting the kind of experience that you wanted, um, like the, not you, but like someone who actually wanted the garden, <laughs> and actually hide the labor um, entailed in getting that material um, to that location. And I thought it was such an interesting thing because you're also working with this question of like depth, you know, not just in time, terms of the Chinese um, screen, but also in the Western tradition of the notion of you know, we have painting as this notion of representation on a flat screen, but you're doing something that's multidimensional. So the very idea that you're playing with question of depth and perception and how things get turned into an aesthetic idea, which then starts to mask this notion of the labor to get that certain material. Because we are, when you actually look, around, at least in the video around your work, you very, you very much realize it's not just a question of like the perfect image, but the question of you moving through space and getting the materials themselves, which you know, beg the question of like what they're supposed to um, represent in the relationship. And so I was just wondering if you would talk a little more about you know, the, the idea of perfect materials and how that actually, because you said, um, you said so viscerally, like imagine someone having to mine and the lives lost and and you know break the the bone um, breaking work to get those perfect rocks, just so someone could say yes, that one. Um, and how that became in itself like a way of masking all that labor. Um, I guess, like, yeah, like, when you go to, like, I guess, like, uh, like, I guess off the top of my head, like, as an example, like, so for instance, like, you know, for a Chinese garden and, like, during the Ming Dynasty, they would apparently, like, South China, I guess, like, was, like, the best place to get these rocks that looked like um, something that came out of like one of the um, like out of a painting and like and I remember like reading through my research um, from Ji Cheng's like how to like you know like he like wrote this book on like telling everyone this is how you have like the perfect garden um, back during that time and you know like even mentioned like how to transport these rocks for instance like he's like by water is like the best idea or um, like you know, like moving, having like logs or something like that to like roll this rock all the way from like one point A to point B and, and stuff like that. And like, and like seeing like it's okay. And like, um, and just so like being very fascinated by how, you know, like people would go to these great lengths to just try to like find something within nature and, and like, trying to put it together in their garden and like I even read that that you know they would graft different rocks together to like make it look like a mountain um in their garden or they would um like, what else did they like it's just like but also just like thinking about like you know like trans like it's like a non-functional garden it's like a functional garden in a way where it's like natural, you feel like you're in the mountains, you feel like you're, you're out in nature, but really like, it doesn't really serve any practical purpose. It's just like, it's just there. It's just like, here's a bush that we got from this region. Here's like these flowers, here are these like fruit trees that are just pretty, but like have really bad fruit that no one can really eat, you know? And, um, and like, so it's just like kind of, and they talked about like, the switch from I think oh my god this is embarrassing like where like before the Ming Dynasty like it was more practical and then during the Ming Dynasty it became unpractical and so it's just all truly purely about aesthetics and about um about like yeah just like having this garden and like this kind of like you know like kind of your na like neighborly competition about whose garden is better than yeah. others and stuff like that and and I don't know I just found that really fascinating and just kind of like how does that like really tie in with today like how like you know our relationship mm -hmm. with nature like is this why we're so controlling is this why like you know from like this practice that happened like thousands of years ago or like like you know just like 
Um, and then especially like taking, you know, like gardening into a, um, like a non-practical way, like an English garden, for instance, or even like a botanical garden. Like why are we spending so much energy and water to maintain like, you know, a, like a tropical environment mm -hmm. in Washington, DC or New York, for instance, like it makes no sense. And it's right. just like, I don't know, like so it's just like all these ideas like coming in and it's just like, oh, like. Oh, but I, I love, I love the fact that you have um, such an amazing layered approach to it. So from any kind of perspective, you're actually kind of breaking open all these other possibilities of kind of experiencing those ideas. Like even, not even just a question of materiality and labor, which is, you know, um, very much a, an important part of contemporary art practice, but you're also reopening up these, I think, amazing questions about the very notion of aesthetics where in mean, these old arguments, um, you know, as old as what we even might consider like the avant-garde is as a concept about the idea is art, the idea that's represented or is it actually about the materiality and someone actually, you know, experience it. And when you bring up the idea of capitalism in these, per in these contexts, like you bring up the really amazing concept of status because as, as, as much as you joke about like neighborly competition, these were vast empires with only the wealthiest people. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so in certain cities, yes, the wealthy, but it, it actually changed the nature of society, changed the very notion of class, ch changed the notion of what was even considered virtuous and noble by which you could own an, um, an, a garden and have the right kind of aesthetic and the aesthetic itself it didn't matter if people's lives were lost or material were burnt out or people, right? it, it mattered that it looked beautiful enough to claim the moral high ground, the social mm -hmm. high ground of the right kind of virtue and the right kind of plant, even if you couldn't eat it, like the beautiful fruit, even if you couldn't eat it. And I do find that so in terms of contemporary notions of aesthetics, like so like on, you know, like on the nose about how we consider, like if something looks good, it must be good. <laughs> um, and we like, kind of like mask the labor of that and the fact that we're all kind of contributing to the notion of like socially we also you know have to kind of recirculate these notions right and so we're doing labor too and the question of the value of that labor in terms of who gets affected about these notions of like the good aesthetic it starts to shift everyone's priorities so now that everyone wants to aspire to this level of you know aesthetic rightness um, and so I just think that's like a really amazing thing that you have embedded in your work, um, especially these works. But um, awesome. yeah, I was like totally impressed with that. But I do have one question though, um, that okay. I don't mean to like throw you off, but this is like my last question. So you, you um, raised the Beardstadt painting as an example of like realism in painting. Mm -hmm. And I had always kind of understood Beardstadt a little differently because he always seemed to be so mythologizing. He like leaves out, unless there's like one noble quote unquote savage, he otherwise leaves it barren when it wasn't. And it's this idea of like the perfect West waiting for you. Like, you know, it's like that, it's those exoticizing commercials to like um, some like all paid for resort, except it's like the West to be conquered, right? And so I always think about that notion of like representation is it's not so much realistic, but like all mythologies, it's about values and ideas. And in that way, it kind of, I think, dovetails or like at least like converges if not crashes into your other ideas at play your ideas of aestheticism and so I, I just was wondering if you could clarify what you thought the the potency is or like the value about looking at someone like Beardstadt and and kind of um ascribing him a kind of a realistic status or realism as his like motive representation and that and that will be it thank you thank you um Great question. Like with Bierstadt, it's just because he is making like these very hyper realistic landscapes that don't exist, you know, and most of them are not real. And like, but somehow he he has this capacity to be able to, without just like either using abstraction or like kind of like ink, like ink drawing compared to like Chinese painting. It's like this very, 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 very representational kind of like painting that for instance, like we cannot replicate in physical life and stuff like that, which I found really, really fascinating and like kind of like having that, com and like maybe a little bit why I wanted to compare Bierstadt to like Chinese painting is because like here are these like two imagined landscapes in a way, like not imagined, like both of them have 
you know, like I would, like I would say like Chinese landscape painters are always out in nature and like looking at nature and I wouldn't say like trying to replicate nature, but like they're just doing like this, I guess like this moment, you know, like just like putting it down and they're not out there like, you know, doing color studies or anything like that, you know, it's just like this simple poetic like gesture. And then with beer stat, it's just like this complete like hyper realistic, like pay me money to come and see my paintings, like, and have that like this like virtual reality experience for his time, like during his time. Um, and, you know, but with his paintings, we can't really go out and find like, you know, any mountain or any rock. We can't do that. Um, like we can't find that within nature. And then with Chinese painting, like we're able to find a rock, even if we have to like cobble a couple of rocks together or something like that to make this mountainscape that looks like it came from a Chinese painting. And, and I guess with Bierstadt also is just, you know, like, yeah, like it's also this very like colonialist and whitewashed way of like producing landscape and um, of something that doesn't exist and just, and all for entertainment value in a way, but also in a way, like, I feel like, you know, through reading about Chinese landscape painting in a way like, you know, I guess like these nobles and merchants and everyone who can afford like a Chinese garden, a private Chinese garden is kind of like looking at them in the same way of like, inter I wouldn't say like entertainment value, but just kind of just, you know, like wanting to like have like, I guess, their like I guess Asian or Chinese beer stat version or something like that in their home but physical and versus like you know like how large scale like beer stat paintings are usually really really huge and and you feel like you're in that environment and then especially like the scale of the mountains and everything you're like you're like this big that little deer in that mountain and anyways um yeah so <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? It's already 7.35. I hope no one's like falling asleep and you know, all that good stuff. Feels weird to not like, thank you Ray for, for unmuting. So it feels like there's someone to actually to talk to <laughs> instead of just like me talking to an empty space. <laughs> Can read Izzy's chat. Um, I think to take this work a step further, you could explore not only man made natural environments and our control of nature for selfish or human centric reasons, but also the rise of new manufactured natural environments these days with hydroponic gardens. Yes, you're right. For the purpose of damage control. On one hand, we're doing good for the planet. On the other hand, we are, we are bending nature to accommodate us rather than accommodate accommodating nature ourselves and yes Izzy like that's exactly kind of like the point that I was like trying to get at and um about how like our like wanting to control like whether it be um you know cutting down trees in the rainforest whether it be like you know hydroponic gardening whether it be like any of that it just feels like why do we always have to like just have this this human hand to it like why were we not able to just let nature be nature and like, but also like, just like, even though there are um, people, there are farmers that are like doing, um, that are doing it. So for instance, like in agriculture, I think in Kansas or in the Midwest, they are, there are people who are practicing trying to do this regenerative agriculture um, to kind of like go back to like what was more indigenous to the land because then like, you know, you have like plants and seeds that are going to be more like strong, like to survive, like the type of weather that we're going through. Um, but it is just kind of like ridiculous, especially now that we're noticing with like COVID and climate change and like, you know, California being on fire. I'm sorry, like Jessica, if you're still here, like that California, oh, and Irene, <laughs> like who are living in California and witnessing these fires, you know, it's just like, um, like it's just you know like all we want to do is just try to control it with either like a device some technology or um you know something and when really it's just like you know we have over exploited the land for our own 
personal gain and stuff like that. So I don't know. So again, like the show is just kind of like going back to this, like the whole thesis of like, you know, like having us like rethink, like, what are we, what are we really doing? And stuff like that. Like, are we gardening for good? Are we not, you know, maybe there's like other practices we need to revisit that we have forgotten about and that we don't really need like 20 different roses in our garden or something like that. So <laughs> any last questions? So is that it for questions, everybody? Okay. Thank you, Fawn. That was Thank like you. such an amazing talk. I love the video. The artwork, of course, is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please remember to um, keep visiting the show. Tell everybody who um, you think would be interested about it. And um, don't forget about our programs, The Forest Bathing, next Saturday, 26th. The gallery, the um, conversation that Fawn will have with her colleagues on the 20th of October, which will delve into these issues further. And the pollinator gardening workshop on November 14th. Um, please um, do a fill out your evaluation forms. You have the link in the chat. We'll also be sending you that um, as a follow-up email for those of you who have logged in as yourselves. I think um, Alex Epstein might get a thousand evaluations. <laughs> if you could give those to your students, that would be awesome. And, um, and again, don't forget to show your support by um, just giving us a small token of appreciation for all this fabulous work um, that we were able to ask Fawn to do with us. Uh, have a great night. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you so much again and for coming and listening and um, yeah, check out the show online and the photos and all that good stuff. And, and yeah, and I guess I'll just maybe do another quick shout out. I'll have like a, a studio or um, what do you call it? Like an open studio visit with the Hirshhorn and Betsy Johnson, the curator, one of the associate curators there on October, sometime in October. So stay tuned for that if you want to keep hearing me rambling about, about stuff. So, <laughs> and again, thank you all for coming and spending your time with us and stuff like that here online. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.